All right, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Sonny Bagel. I'm an interventional radiologist here at Vasco Institute of Virginia. And we're going to bring you this uh, live embolization case uh, via the JiggleMed app, and it's supported by Terumo. Um, and I am joined by Dr. Aaron Fishman from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And we'll also be joined by Ari Isaac. Somebody's running a little bit late, so Aaron is doing a, a little stand-in for him temporarily, which we appreciate as well. And uh, in the room, just so you guys know who's here as well, um, we have Tiffany to my right. So Tiffany is our, our tech scrubbing this case, uh, Maria, one of our nurses, and Michelle, one of our other nurses as well. Um, and so Aaron, let me take you through a little bit about this case, okay, to get us started off. That was good, uh, Sony. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, great job during treat, of course. Uh, so I'm sure your, your contribution has to be really valuable. So uh, this is a 65-year-old male. He um, has uh, BPH, uh, and his AUA score is about 28. Um, he had actually, interestingly, a TERP done in 2012, and he recurred with his symptoms over the last two years. Uh, his symptoms are mostly obstructive. Um, he had an MRI done, which uh, Danny can pull up here in just a few minutes when we have a chance. On that MRI, actually, you can see it's not a very large prostate. Uh, you can see here it's very nodular there within the central gland. There's not much peripheral zone, um, but very heterogeneous uh, central gland signal. Um, and it's about 40 grams. Uh, and the reason we chose this particular case, um, which um, to do actually live is, one, these glands, as you know, tend to be a little bit more challenging from an embolization perspective. Um, and we often use even smaller uh, microcatheters for these particular types of cases. Uh, which I'll highlight uh, during this case. So let me take you through the angiogram here. Do you have any questions yet, uh, Aaron, to this? To this yeah, point? well, I mean, while you're, while you're, you're going through this, uh, I have two questions. One is, sure. do, you, do you do anything differently in post-TERP patients? Do you find that uh, these cases are more difficult, maybe less difficult? Is there something different that you would do? And then the second question I have is, uh, in terms of success rates, and this is something that I struggle with a little bit, small glands. How, what do you tell patients when they have a small gland in terms of clinical success? Yeah, so that's really good. So, uh, yeah, so in, in terms of TERP, I'd say the biggest thing we do is we make sure they have some sort of MR imaging. Um, as you know, they get that real wide goblet defect in the top of the prostate um, from a TERP, uh, but um, they often will grow back these just one or two really sort of macroadenomas that really push on the urethra. And so whether knowing if they come from the left or come from the right, that can be really valuable. Also confirming that they actually have really considerable BPH left. Um, so I think having uh, the baseline MRI is very important. From a technical perspective, we don't find them that much different in terms of you know their uh, arterial supply, their vascularity. It is interesting, you'll often see that defect as missing tissue, whereas usually in a PAE, you'll see good lateral lobe or say median lobe perfusion, like that parenchymal stain. But here you'll be missing, of course, where that TERP defect was. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something I, I, I see, you know, a little bit differently and do a little bit differently. In terms of outcomes with small glands, you know, we did this study, although it was short, it was a short term study, it was only six month outcomes that we looked at. And we compared uh, prostate volumes less than 50 versus 50 to 80 and then over 80. And we did not have any significant difference in quality of life outcome or IPSS outcome out to six months. That being said, um, we may get, we may be a little bit more distal with our microcatheter. We probably use a little bit smaller beads, which I think are probably important um, in these smaller glands because obviously the vessels are smaller. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, if you look at some of the other studies that have been published, they, they contradict that to some degree because they say larger glands do better, right? Over 80, over 100. Right. The, the difference in those studies, of course, is they didn't stratify 50 to 88, you know, less than 50 over 80. It was just either large or small. Um, so I think um, there are some challenges, but I, and I still propose some pretty good success rates. I don't find them very much different when I quote to patients. Um, how do you handle that situation? Well, you know, I I don't give them, you know, a lot of optimism if their gland is 30 to 40, something like that. I, 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 I like to keep the expectations relatively low for these types of cases. And I think part of the reason is that from a technical perspective, it may be more challenging. And so the, it, it is possible that you may only be able to embolize one yeah. artery. Um, so maybe the technical success goes down a bit. And maybe that's why we have lower clinical success with the smaller glands. I don't know that it's necessarily related to the gland size itself. It's probably more related to the procedural aspects, maybe you don't get as much embolic in, things like that. 
But yeah, um, I, I've so, I sort of say, you know, 50 to 75% for the small glands and then, you know, obviously 80, 90% clinical success for the larger glands. I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I think that's a very reasonable success rate too. So, and I agree. I think the technical success um, is probably the biggest challenge with these small glands. They tend to not be as tortuous because the arteries, of course, are not as redundant, uh, but they're, of course, not as large. And that's where I think the value of a, a smaller microcatheter uh, comes into play. So, yeah. Uh, if you can see this here on the screen here, uh, this is our just distal aortogram and showing the iliac tortuosity. And as soon as we saw this, you know, first thing is I wish we kind of went radial. Uh, his height kind of precluded that. Uh, I can tell you that 5'10", 5'11", uh, even though we tend to stick a little high on the wrist, we were a little weary some of that. And again, again, I'd love to hear your sort of feedback on that with that height because we're always a little bit afraid about if we go radial, will we be able to reach if we need to coil off a collateral uh, what are your thoughts on that, Aaron? So, yeah, I use six feet as a cutoff, just as a general rule, number number one, because it's easy to remember that number. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think I would probably still do radial for a case like this just because of the tortuosity. And so one of the things that I'll do before I do pretty much all PE now is a CTA, just so I want so I can map out the iliac arteries more, more than anything. Not not so much to identify the, the prostatic arteries, because sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but it's more for the iliacs and the atherosclerotic disease. And so if I identify somebody with really severe atherosclerotic disease, then I would maybe not consider radial in those cases. But if they have an angulation like this, then I would favor it. Um, yeah. If someone's six foot three, I, I probably would do femoral uh, for the most part. But I think with some of the catheters that we have, the the, the 2 prograde that's 150 should reach pretty easily most of the collaterals. And, you know, the one thing I, that I'll say about radial versus femoral worst case scenario you do radial you do one side you can't do the other side it's not the worst thing in the world to to switch to femoral i mean people think that's a technical failure if you have to cross over but it really isn't isn't it's not a big yeah no so i think if we we probably have 46 the radial femoral but if we could use a higher cutoff i think that definitely would make it would make a difference and probably get more people into that into that yeah. Uh, into that radio group. And in, there's no doubt having him sent home sooner is definitely much better uh, in terms of just a comfort. Uh, and, yep. you know, in our situation where we're, you know, in an outpatient center with, you know, a portable flat panel C arm, what's nice about radio, as you know, is it's so much easier to manipulate the room. So for us, we tend to do our radio case with the arm out and we're very far from the source and the monitor's right in front of your face. So things are very easy from that perspective. So, this was our hypogastric run on the left. So we just, uh, we got up and over, actually to the point of radio, you know, we had to use a reverse curve. So we use a SAS to get over. And this is just a, a glide cat that we have up and over in the hypogastric. And you can see here as I'll play through this run, I have a pointer that you'll be able to see on the screen. In Did you second. go up and over with the glide calf, uh, just a regular angled glide calf? No, I went up and over first with a SAS and then exchanged over a glide wire for the glide calf. You know, in cases like this with those torches, like sometimes we'll put a sheath up and over like a five French, uh, yeah. five French sheath or something like that. But the problem is, as you know, then you got to go to the right and you got a lot of sheath hanging out the groin. So in this particular case, you know, we did our run and we usually do a four for eight straight contrast run. Uh, there's a little motion on here, but just to give a little anatomy for everybody else here, hypogastric, superior and inferior glute. And, you know, we always say that the pedendal, which is right here, overlaps the 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 soup, the inferior glute right here for some time. It's actually subtly right behind there. Uh, and then we tend to use a rule that the prosthetic sits between the pedendal and the umbilical. This rule has been sort of holding us, holding us straight, I think for a number of years. And so we look for some curvilinear branch between the two and that's what we found here. And initially we actually thought this would be coming off the obturator, which is right here, which ends in a V. Uh, but you know, what's interesting is what happened was as soon as we, we, uh, we, we got this run. The first thing I did is we put the microcatheter and the microcatheter went in right here. So the microcatheter actually went in. You, uh, I can't see my arrow here, but where the tip of the microcatheter and microwire are, they're actually in the pedendal, not in the obturator. So we were trying to get in the obturator. Uh, rather than actually just pull out altogether, we did a run from right here. And uh, I'll show you that run here on the next, uh, next uh, sequence here. Once we did this run, we actually identified that that artery, lo and behold, which is right here, and the prostatic actually does come off the pedendal. Uh, and those, for those who are not used to seeing the pedendal, this is the pedendal artery because it goes all the way posterior in the pelvis before it comes anterior and then supplies the penis. So, Aaron, any comments on that so far? Yeah, you know, I, 
I, I like when it comes off the pudendal from a technical perspective, because I think it's a little bit easier to cannulate as compared to, you know, the direct origins. Uh, yeah. But then there's also the issue of reflux and you really don't, you know, in cases like this, reflux can be slightly more detrimental, particularly with a really robust pudendal like that. So um, I, I'm more hesitant to embolize more proximally in cases like this. I don't think that's the issue here. I think you're going to probably want to go pretty distal in this yeah. in this artery so you'll be well past it but there are cases particularly in small glands where um, a very proximal origin can can create a situation where reflux could be an issue exactly and so and the great thing about this is so we're using a 2-0 prograde that was a hand injection i tend to use a 3-0 medallion with you know injecting my uh, microcatheters and do runs in each of these small arteries and this is the imaging we got from it which i think is pretty good considering even i didn't even remask it but um, so we got this image and like I said, we're using that pro grade two O it's, you know, and I'll talk a little bit more as we get into the subsequent, uh, images. Cause I just want to take you to where we are. Cause we're not yet ready to treat, but we're ready to sort of address a problem here. So, so this is when I right. got into that branch off the pedendal, obviously I'm refluxing the pedendal. I did this through a three CC medallion. And like I mentioned to Aaron, it's a very small gland. So actually the perfusion of the gland is right here. As you know, we always identify the prostate by the by the pubic symphysis. For those who aren't uh, doing a lot of PAE, we want to see a branch that's going to the pubic symphysis. Uh, so, and I'm injecting pretty hard, which is why I think I'm filling these other collaterals that go up here. Um, and then this is our uh, a rectal branch here going south. So, you know, at this point, I don't know. I do. You guys kind of want to weigh in here on what you do. You can weigh in so, while I'm doing. So, doing Sonny, let me let me tell you what I would do in a case like this. And I yeah. actually have to go to uh, to the office and see a, a patient in clinic, sure. a prostate yeah. patient who's been eagerly waiting for me. But <laughs> I think in a case like this, you have two options. One is you could um, you could try to get very distal to uh, that rectal branch, and I guess distal to those bladder branches in that prostatic artery there. Uh, but there is that is a big, big artery, and and, and I would probably at least consider coiling it, uh, the yeah. rectal branch first, and then go into the prostatic branch um, above it and try to get as distal as you can, um, and then and then see where you're at. And I think once you get distal into that branch and you give a lot of nitro, you'll probably see a lot of the gland open up. Okay. All right. How about you? Thank you. Uh, Aaron, I like by that the idea. Way. I like that idea. I think it depends how how uh, how deep you can get your catheter into the prostatic artery. How comfortable you feel with that. Um, it's hard. It's hard for me to tell exactly based on what I'm seeing here. But yeah, um, you're if you thought a little you could get late. in pretty yeah. deep, then I I don't know that you need to coil. But if you couldn't, coiling is a good idea. I think we might need to to to, to, to get in really distal just because of the size of the gland, and we'll probably hit stasis very soon. So. Yeah. You know, may not be a bad idea. I mean, I think here, what I'm, I obviously went down to the bottom branch, the wire first easily went ironically into the prostatic. Um, but I'm in the, what I believe is rectal collateral. Let's just do a run here and 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 see what this looks like. You know, um, prove it. You're gonna prove let's, it. Let's All prove right. it because the last thing we'd want to find out, of course, is that this did have prostatic supply and we were embolizing it uh, nonetheless. So we'll do a That's little right. run. That's right. You don't. You don't want that. You don't want that. We don't want that. So there you go. Yeah, so it's definitely rectal, and I'm just refluxing the prostatic, right? So, um, yep. Yep. I would say so. Would you agree to that? Yeah. I would definitely agree. Definitely That's agree. a big branch. I, I would I would go more distal and coil it. Go more distal within it, right? Yeah, I agree. Yep. So that's what we'll do. We'll uh, take this catheter down. Uh, a little further. Let me just re let me just uh, mask this out a little bit. Take that wire back. Does, does your patient have hemorrhoids there, Sonny? Uh, not that I know of, actually. But you know, it's interesting. There oh, is, as okay. you know, a lot of overlap between mm -hmm. BBH yep. and hemorrhoids. And so, let me, why don't you? Uh, what's your? You know, what when you're choosing a microcatheter, Ari? What do you choose? Are you choosing it based on gland size? Are you choosing it based on you just have a go-to or wires that you like that are compatible? You know, I think um, I tend to, to like the option of the balloon occlusion catheter for sniper if, if the arteries are big enough. If they're not big enough, then I really like the uh, 2.0, uh, ProGrade Alpha. Yeah, you um, know, I'll, I'll, reminds I'll, me that it's, yeah. I'll agree with you, uh, with you, Ari. I think, I think if you're going to use a non balloon tip microcatheter, this is really. The 2.0, the 2 alpha catheter is really the, the best, my favorite option. I, I think it from a trackability 
injection rate and wire and coil compatibility, it, it sort of fits all of those categories as well, if not better than most. Um, so that's that's something that we probably agree on on this. And and a lot of people don't know this, but you can you can put ONA coils, pushable coils, through the prograde alpha. That I, I've heard a lot of people are kind of skeptical about that because it well, doesn't take an ONA wire, but it will take ONA coil. Well, you could put put them through, but then the, there's the other question whether you should be using pushable coils in 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 these these cases. I mean, I, I don't use pushable <laughs> coils. I use detachable. Ever? But uh, you know, if people want to use them, that's fine. Yeah. I just, I just don't. I don't want to give up the control with a detachable coil in a case like this, particularly down here. When you're, uh, where do you, where are you afraid to lose them? Where, where would they go if you lost control? Well, it's, it's not necessarily about losing them. I think, I, I think the size of the coil is really important. Um, and I think getting it in the right spot, I mean, it may, you're not going to necessarily lose it down the pudendal, which would probably be the worst case scenario. Um, but, you know, the coil sizes are more appropriate. Um, you know, you're not going to be fighting sort of pushing it in or getting it stuck in the microcatheter or anything like that. So, I, you know, if you lose your microcatheter and you have to get back in, it's a pain in the pain. So I'd rather I'd rather not have that happen. Got it. All right. Well, I will tell you, if anyone is uh, interested, you can put tornado coils through a prograde alpha with no problem. I've, I've never gotten them stuck. Um, so that's an option. Yeah, we're about to coil this off here. It's a little spasm there, but in that rectum, but we'll just coil this off here and then pull back and get into that prosthetic. So Ari, you, your take back on coils again. That's really interesting. I'm going to use, uh, sorry, this is perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to, I'm going to use uh, just a, a, a two millimeter coil here. You, you actually, can I just see the, the packaging on this please real quick? So you, you gen, tend to use just pushables as well, correct? For prostate, yes. Yeah. 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 Is there any, uh, I guess, reason why you feel that you wouldn't be doing that, you know? Well, you know, there's that situation that we've talked about before and even published about where you you, you can't get your your wire to take the prostatic artery it keeps going down the superior vesicle or something like that. And so you decide to try to coil the origin of that artery to deflect your wire. And that, that might be one situation where you really need some precision and, and, and a, a detachable coil would be helpful in that situation what do you think yeah i agree i mean i think that's exactly like a really tenuous you know spot if you will um in this particular case yep. i don't know that it's it's as tenuous but uh yeah there's no doubt i don't want it to uh to bounce back of course that would be a disaster uh and covering covering the prosthetic yeah. let me just get the back end there what were you saying there? Yeah, you, that's that's actually one thing you want you, you don't want it to cover the prosthetic you, you, I agree. You don't want it to cover the prosthetic. That would be a, a, a bad result. So in that case, if you're concerned about that, then you might want to use a detachable as well. Most of the time, I feel like you have enough uh, room with a pushable to not worry about that. Uh, what about you used to use um, gel, gel, uh, gel foam tornado or gel foam torpedoes at one point? You Say still again? do that ever? You ever use gel foam torpedoes anymore? Okay. Uh, gel foam torpedoes, I'm not generally. No. Yeah. So... Hang on one second. No, I'm not generally using those uh, through th through those. Give me a scissor. And then hang on one second, Ari. Yeah. So yep. I'm not generally using those uh, in that situation, but I am using um, like a gel foam slurry at the end of some of these cases if right. if they're yeah. say difficult or challenging. You know. Uh, let me favor. Yes. Give me a uh, three. Uh, hang on one second, yeah. Ari. Let me just get a piece of uh, inventory here. Let me. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. In time, we'll just recap where we are in the case here. So, Sonny has done a uh, ipsilateral oblique angiogram of the left hypogastric arteries, and it's a smaller prostate we're looking at. So, it's not a really um, large blush, prosthetic blush, but what you're seeing is a, a somewhat larger rectal branch uh, and then a smaller uh, prostatic branch. And at this point, he is uh, working on managing the collateral to the rectum um, by getting a catheter down and coiling it off in order to protect it from the beads going that direction. Cause you may get reflux of beads cause it's so small. It's going to really shut off pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so, and actually, so Ari, one thing I want to mention to you too is, you know, when you were, we talked about this small glands, just as I'm working here, did you, do you feel that with certain small glands, there's any certain precautions you take? 
Um, so I think with smaller glands, you have to expect that they are going that you're going to get stasis pretty quickly. And so it's probably this situation where you really need to be meticulous about diluting your your embolic um, and and potentially and going down a size maybe if, depending on what your normal size is that you use. Um, but it could, you could you could you're going to get to stasis really quick. And if you have any clumping whatsoever, uh, you're really at risk of having an a, a inadequate embolization. When you're doing that, correct? So, are you, what about people with post terp? Because this gentleman's also post terp. You take any I mean, that's special a, another another factor, right? Because part of their prostate's already gone, so actually their glands even smaller than than maybe what you've calculated. Are you are you are you routinely doing patients who've had post post procedure, like post, say microwave, post laser? You know, are you doing things like that or no? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say routinely, they're not the majority of my patients, but they certainly are a minority and, and there's no reason not to do them. There's nothing um, in the data that suggests that PAE won't work for those type of patients. So, but I think you need to keep in mind that the appearance of the prostate is going to be different when you see it on cross-sectional imaging and also when you see in geography, because there's going to be an area, excuse me, an area that is, uh, you, you'll, you'll see an absence of blush because that's where the, uh, the, the void from the turf was. Okay. Okay. So one, one other question for you too. you you know, we talked about, we talked about using uh, like imaging, for example, through microcatheters. How do you generally handle your, sorry, if the screen is looking like that while we're just getting us everybody, how, how do you handle certain imaging? Do you power inject through them? Do you hand inject through them? What do you do? Uh, so I, yeah. So I personally don't power inject that often. Um, I don't, I don't power inject my hypo run. And, and the reason is basically somewhat laziness and, I don't want to run out of the room for it. That's, that's kind of our routine. Um, so I tend to just do a hand injection with a 10 cc syringe. And the, and the vast majority of the time, that gives me enough uh, detail and, and good enough, uh, uh, a good enough image to locate the prosthetic artery and figure out my plan. Um, and then when I'm in the prosthetic artery, I'm definitely not uh, doing a power injection at that point because I want to control the pressure of the injection Excellent. with my thumb. Uh, and so I will... Like mo a lot of people do this technique, and I think this is may come go back, go back to Carnivale at some point. But um, you do a slow injection initially to kind of emulate what your embolic, what your embolization is going to be like. Okay. And then you you may push a little harder at the end and to try to buy some of the collaterals that are present, uh, so that you can not be surprised mid mid embolization. Do you? Um, and then the other thing I was going to ask you is, do do you have a s situation in which? when you're say embolizing with certain uh, size particles that you're afraid of, can you guys just uh, knock those lights down for me, that you're afraid of certain types of um, uh, particulate or even that gel foam like you may use, not getting into, getting through the catheter. And in this particular case, let's say like a 2.0 catheter, yeah. are, you, are you afraid of something like that happening? So I, I, I'd say I'm not afraid with embolic because I, I hardly ever, um, I don't ever use more than a, very rarely do I use a 300 to 500 type embolic. And most of the time I'm, I'm at a 250 or 200. Um, okay. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not concerned, but the gel foam is another issue. The gel foam slurry will clog up a 2.0 uh, because as you know, and we, we tend to make it pretty similarly, we make it pretty thick because we want to be able to control, control it pretty well on the injection. Um, and so what I usually what ends up happening is when I put my gel foam slurry, um, I'm mostly time I'm done with that side uh, and I'll probably pull the catheter at that point and just clear it out really well on the back table. Yep. Um, and then before I put it back in for the, for the contralateral side, if I okay. need to go somewhere else on the Ipsy side, I just take it out and then reinsert. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think, I think there's a give and a take. You want a small catheter, but you're also going to deal with, with um, clogging problems. Okay. Do you, um, hey, while we have a minute here, I'm just getting some stuff ready. I'm getting the embolic yeah. out. What's your embolic of yeah. choice size? Size. Sorry. Size. Size. Yeah. Choice and, size embolic embolic. Of choice yeah, size. Absolutely. Yeah. So I use um, I use Embazine uh, 250 quite often. Um, okay. I, I tend to like that size. I think it's right in the middle, uh, and that tends to work pretty well. Um, you know, when you're talking about size, the thing that you have to be worried about is I don't worry about so much about the non-target embolization, although that can happen, but you're going to cause the patient a lot of symptoms in the post uh, kind of peri-procedural period. 
if okay. you, uh, you use a smaller, smaller lead. However, you're trading that for perhaps more efficacy over the long run because you may get more necrosis. And so it's a fine balance and it kind of comes down to how much um, support you have to, to talk to patients when they're complaining of these type of symptoms they can get uh, and also um, what kind of results you think you're getting with your size. So, uh, so the answer to your question, the long answer was 250 is, is where mostly 250 or 200 is where I'm at. So do you ever, do you start ever like hundreds, like in smaller glands though and something like this or in a repeat, just in terms of like, you, yeah. you're making sure that you're going to get really good dyslumbolization. Like here, you know, as I'm yeah. getting the, sorry, the stuff in place, I'm just curious if that's something you'd consider doing. Yeah. I think in a smaller gland like this, going down to like a hundred uh, it might, might be a good idea and and like you said also in a repeat where you've already embolized once um and so definitely in a smaller one thinking about a smaller size like 100 micron is, is a reasonable thought okay good so just so you know here what i'm doing i'm just getting my catheter backed up here so i'm just there with that yeah. tortuous iliac which actually speaks to sort of the importance of doing this from uh from a uh Femoral approach, you can see what happened to me here. So this is actually like any like, like any nice example. Look what happened to my iliac. See? So I'm gonna pull this whole system down. I don't know if we'll be able to salvage it. Looks like we are actually able to. Uh, and if, I don't know if we'll be able to get the micro over enough to do this, but we'll see. See our our our, our base catheter pull back. In fact, Aaron had mentioned this very thing too, which is uh, if you're in a situation like this, we talked about before you got on. Are you gonna use a? Uh, let me just get the glide wire. Uh, you can keep this all together. If you're going to use a get up and over, are you going to be able to get uh, pushability with something like this? And so we'll switch back and go back to our glide and, and get back up and over. But that's exactly what happened is the pushability uh, was not there with this base support. So a good reason to go radial is height was a limitation. What were your, what were you, what's your feeling on height requirements for radial access? Cause his was, his was six feet and, 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 uh, Yours tends to be, I thought, around 5'10". What would you say? I if you could hear me there. Ari. So I'm getting more and more. Conservative. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. In terms yeah. of your height. I'm getting more and more radio. conservative with my height. Yeah. Um, because uh, I think we're getting into these situations where we need to go more distal. We need to get down to the internal pedendal. And I don't want to be limited by that. So I used to say 5'11". I'm kind of edging down to 5'10", but there are other factors to take into account as well. You have to look at the patient's arm length. If a patient has really long arms, that'll eat up your catheter. And so you might want to ask the patient what size sleeve they wear in a dress shirt. Yeah, uh, I like that. If they're in the 34 to 35 range as opposed to the 32 to 33 range, that's a... Um, and then also how torches, the other question you need to ask the patient is how tall were you at your tallest point? <laughs> because a lot of, <laughs> yeah, a lot of men when they come for PAE have lost, lost a couple inches in height. Yeah. And so they say, oh, I'm, I'm 5'10 now, but at one point I was six feet. And so yeah. the thing that a, lot of, that a lot of people don't remember is that even though the, the patient has shrunk because of changes in their vertebral column, the aorta is still the same length. Uh, exactly. And so exactly. uh, you're you're going to lose catheter length on that. So those are the two two tips I would say. I would say about five ten is where I'm at now, and ask about the sleeve size and ask about the maximum height they've been in their life. Yeah, so he was thirty three, thirty four, five ten now. Uh, five ten is what he says. Although standing, I thought he might be a little bit less. Um, and that was something that definitely concerned me. And if you had to convert people from radial to femoral, have I had to? Um, yeah, I haven't. It, not in recent memory, and I can't say probably in the last couple of years I haven't. I, I try to be very selective about who I do radial, uh, so okay. I don't have to convert. So you don't have to do that. Convert. I mean, that's obviously key. If you can just make sure you're yeah. in a situation yeah. where you don't have to, that's obviously ideal. Yeah. So by the way, you're going to well, see that hypo this. does not look friendly. Yeah, it's not a very friendly hypo actually. Uh, yeah. But you know, it's actually this is what's good about seeing a case like this is is you'll see our run here. Let me just subtract this for you. Because you actually missed this part. So, you know, we always say some things are so easy, you're just going to do them twice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in this particular you case, you know, here we have uh, the pedendal and the, and the gluteal are so overlapped high up that you think they're actually uh, like the, the pedendal doesn't exist, but it feels late because it's so it's behind. Yeah, you the, see it at the end. Yeah, yeah, at the very end. And that's what we have to get into. Mm -hmm. We know that. So, 
Uh, I'm just going to line this up for our overlay. How's your experience with Terumo coils, and how, how do you how do you find that they've been working for you? Uh, so I will tell you that at our particular institution, we um, we do stock some mm -hmm. Terumo coils, but not very many. And I usually am mm -hmm. not using them, not because right I don't there. think they're good or anything. It's just what our institution has chosen to, to purchase. Okay. Um, how about you? You, you, you have them yeah, over so we, at, uh, at Viv? We, yeah, no, we do. And actually, um, I'll be honest with you, so we like them a lot. They, um, yeah. it, I think in terms of, obviously, we talked about just safety of bushy blade. I think there's fine. There's yeah. nothing we find really, I, you know, odd or abnormal about them. I just, um, we do like the fact that, um, you know, you don't have to, uh, the packing happens also by nature of the coils too, you know, not just, oh yeah, we're uh, dropping a coil in and we rely just on fibers. There's an actual, right. you know, swell to the coil and that's a nice advantage. Uh, and the occlusion happens pretty quick. So that's something that's really nice. And, and we feel, I think that, that that's been given good results. Um, obviously, um, you know, we use them in different situations. Um, by the way, here's it's back in the, uh, back yeah. in that pedendal and you'll Finding see the origin there. Yeah. I'm just defining it so we can get into this, which shouldn't take too long. And, um, and then, um, so yeah, I mean, overall we've liked him a lot and maybe Ari could fill you in on what happened. Well, he, he got that coil down, right? No, you know, what's funny <laughs> is we were going to push. Yeah. And uh, we got backed out. Can you? Uh, oh, I see. So, so we do got. You a, think, do, what do you think about pushable coils now, Ari? Well, it's uh, no, no. It wasn't, same, it wasn't I mean, the yeah. coil that pushes out. It was the. It was actually our base gatherer. But it's funny. <laughs> yeah. You guys can have this debate because, all day long. It's because you didn't go radial, right? Exactly. Well, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but it, it, you know, the pushable coils, I think, make it a little bit more challenging, and so. Just knowing that you have detachable coils, uh, I think, gives you at least some sense of uh, you know, some confidence that you can get the coil in. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, so, I, I, said, I think that there's something to be said for that. I mean, obviously, Aaron, you know, uh, while you were gone, Ari mentioned, I'll take the wire back, an example of where a pushable would be, uh, sorry, detachable is really helpful where you want to take out a vessel, let's say like, let's say you're taking out an umbilical or a superior vesicle so you can get into the prostatic. Maybe that's uh, an important consideration, but in every case, uh, you know, cost is no concern and we're building Jurassic Park. I think that's fine, but uh, I, I can agree after having got kicked out here, there's there's certainly a, a luxury of using a, a detachable that I, you know, I missed, you know? Is, you, is your is your base cap as deep as you can get it at this point? Well, so it's funny, you know, it, it, it's it's not as deep as I could get it, but uh, at this point, I don't really want to mess with much because that's what actually got me kicked out was my base cap. All the jokes we're making about detachables. Uh, for those of you've been watching, you know we this this wasn't it's it's not it was actually my base catheter that got me uh, pushed out. So now that I'm in the prostatic. Uh, I just want to do an image here and see 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 how close we are here uh, to actually getting this left side treated. But yeah, the, my base cath Aria, I think you missed this initial pour. It's just, was just a glide cath because of the tortuosity, the iliacs to get up and over, and we elected to not put a sheath in, which uh, that may be something that yeah. uh, would have been a nice uh, idea, if you will. Uh, so here we're going to do an injection in the actual. Uh, prostatic artery and you'll see some nice staining here in the center and we're retrograde filling some superior vesicle branches so I'm injecting pretty hard um, but you can see there centrally there's that gland uh, I may even want to get a little bit further out here um, but obviously it took a lot I'm injecting there lightly but then when I start injecting hard I'm starting to fill that branch up towards the superior vesicle and I have a little pointer here I can show you where that is so this is the prostatic and again, a small gland, but this is that retrograde branch that goes up to the superior vesicle. Any comments on that right now, Ari? Some nitro, 200 nitro. Um, so I think you're limited a little bit by what you're able to do here, right? Because your ability to push that catheter deep is not not that good because of uh, the concern of losing your system again. Yeah. Um, so if you have to work from this position, one thing you might want to do is try some nitro of Arapamil and see if yep. you can get the um, 
maximize the flow to the prostate and minimize the flow up to the superior vesicle. And then the other thing that's that you want to do is really inject lightly on your run and see where where it, which is where is it going preferentially, which I think you're doing now. Yeah, uh, it looks yeah, like it's me, about equal. It's about equal. Yeah. You and, think you can? Can you select that branch at all or no? Yeah, I think we're going to try with that wire yeah, here. Try get a little bit further yeah. out, because um, like I said, with these small glands, that's the beauty of, if you will, this challenge. Uh, we could yeah. put a stronger wire down the center of this microcatheter and try and advance our base catheter over further. Um, it is uh, definitely a feasible option. Uh, if we feel like we're losing a little bit in the system here, that's what we'll try and do. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I, I agree. That's, this is, you know, these are the challenges of, of, of dealing with tortuous iliacs and um, you go back and forth to radial, brachial, axillary, you know, you name it. You'd love to come from top and everybody, but it doesn't come without always some risk and uh, some challenge, if you will. Aaron, are you still on? No, no, okay. Uh, what I was going to talk to Aaron about is I think on the horizon, we have a bunch of uh, microcatheters that are coming out in longer lengths. So we may be able to get past our 510, 511 pipe limit for radial soon with longer microcatheters um, and it'll be interesting when we start using those to see what are the new challenges that we encounter with support with pushability with those longer catheters because i imagine there's going to be some problems that we didn't maybe anticipate uh, because we haven't been using those long catheters yet yeah and that's part of the problem here is like i you know again you can probably see me i'm just being real tenuous here in yeah, terms yeah. of pushing this because i don't want to obviously give access and the other thing we can do is I mean, how concerned are you when you upsize your when you upsize your beads? And by the way, actually here, just getting past that one branch, now you can see preferential flow. Oh, it flows, looks great. Prostatic, oh, yeah, it so yeah. it's better than it was before. It's but just getting, but it's not. Yeah, but you, listen, in an ideal world, of course, you'd love to get all the way in and deep yeah. uh, to the gland. But in this particular case, I'm. By the way, I'm just clearing my catheter really hard. Um, yeah. I think we're going to give some more nitro. Uh, do you have some two? Have you ever tried verapamil in this position, Sonny? So, you know, I tend to stick with nitro just because it's very, very short acting. Yeah. And if they have like blood pressure issues during sedation, I don't mm -hmm. have to worry about it. But um, yeah. how about yourself? You know, I started using it more after the last guest meeting that we were at because there was a gentleman who made a really good point about the effectiveness of nitro on arteries versus verapamil. Um, that nitro really functions on veins, not so much arteries. And uh -huh. I mean, we do see some effect. Hey, you there, Aaron? You back? I'm back. All right. Back. Uh, we're just talking about verapamil versus nitro. How's your uh, feeling on that, Aaron? Well, you know, I I use mostly nitro, but I've been using verapamil a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I haven't. I, I don't think I have enough experience using both of them simultaneously to tell you which one works better in prostate. But I will say that it's very easy for me to get verapamil because I use it in my radial cocktail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Aaron, this is where we are in that prostatic. So now we have flow just to the prostate. Um, and so we're about to embolize. But we're going to go with 250s instead of 100s, because like I said, with the 100s, I have to be really deep uh, in that vessel. Um, I, I, you know, it's interesting. Do you guys think, and again, this is all just hypothesizing, but with that with that situation of having um, uh, verapamil, like you said, already maybe acting more on the arteries than on the veins, is that going to actually, that might help you more with vasospasm, but not so much with something where you're getting the prostatic parenchyma something in blood from other spots. How do you feel about that? It's, it's a good point, but, you know, I, I, I come back to that paper that was published uh, about verapamil and some of the yeah. images they showed. And we've seen similar effects with nitro, but, but they did, I mean, they had a, uh, some nice effects with redirecting flow with verapamil. And so, um, I think it's worth my, my reservation initially was that it was going to really hurt the patient when I injected it, but yeah, um, it, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to be the case in, in these, in the, in the, these small arteries in the prostate. Okay. Okay. Are you guys using any other meds, uh, intra-op besides, uh, your, you know, your typical sedation medications, any particular um, antibiotics or anti-inflammatories, or you just send them home with that stuff? No, I give them, I give them a pre procedural, uh, dose of, uh, and said and, and antibiotic. Okay. Okay. 
Aaron, tell, me, yes. tell me a little bit about your dose of rap mill, Ari. How do you do it? Yeah, it's a good question because I'm trying to figure that part out. I'm not, I'm not um, super. Uh, I'm, I'm, so w- when we do radio, right? You you give two point five. Is that your radio? Point five is what I give. Yeah. Yeah, um, I tend to give two, and I don't know why. I just was remember when we were setting it up, it seemed to be easier for some reason. So the question is, what would you need to give in the prostate? And the kind of where I'm at is like a, like a point five uh, milligram type dose. Um, so I don't know. Do you, what do you think, Aaron? So do you load it up in a syringe and just have it available, and then you just give aliquots? as needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I try to do similar to what I do with nitro where I dilute it up. So I have a, a, a pretty easy dose uh, that I can deliver and then um, deliver like 0.5 milligram aliquot. That makes sense. Yeah. So we're, um, so I just did two fifties. I'm not going to upsize. Uh, I've gotten stasis. I might, yeah. you know, since I know that we're done embolizing the side anyways, Ari, I'm going to actually just, uh, Put the wire in. If it ends up giving up access inside, it's fine because I feel like I've already done yeah. a good embolization. But it's a little perfected. It is a little perfected. That gives perfected my next question. Here. How do you here. guys feel about perfected? Why don't you guys both take that take that question? I I think it's a good idea in this in this circumstance right here. I mean, the thing you don't want is is proximal uh, aggregation of those particles in a small prostate like this. So if you can yeah. get past, you can get deep and try to give some more, I think it's a good idea. Do you routinely do perfected? No, I don't routinely do it. Um, I think there are certain circumstances where it makes sense, uh, like this, or if you were using larger particles that you were worried about proximal aggregation, but if you are diluting out particles that, that are in the 250 to 200 to 100 size range, I don't think that you necess- you don't have to uh, not, push yeah. forward after you're done embolizing. How about, I, I, how about I, I think you could do it here. I think this is completely reasonable. I, I, I don't. I don't obviously don't do it when I use a balloon catheter but with a end tip, end hole microcatheter. I think it's completely reasonable, particularly in this case where you have a nice segment that you can go more distal. Yeah, we're, and I think Aaron, uh, Aaron, you were, and we lost. If I think we're, and we have great. I don't know if you guys can see even that nodule that's actually standing below the bladder. Uh, I, I don't know if it shows up well on the screen. Yeah, but you can actually see the outline. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely I, see that. But I can't actually yep. uh I can't get distal enough here with good support. So rather than just even get kicked out, we're gonna we're gonna move on to the right side because I feel like we have very good stasis and staining on this left side. How many uh, CCs over, of particles did you get in here? About three, which you know, I saw this rule yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw that somebody somebody of course social media is apt to a lot of things, but somebody put on there that they had uh, a rough number of cc's per gland size and I, I find that hard to measure because in beads that you can't see um in beads that you can't see you are um how do you know that you're what you know what what dilution of beads you're actually injecting every time Take the call. yeah i mean i think that's not it's not a good i don't i wouldn't I wouldn't go by that because you're right. Everyone dilutes them differently. Beats function different. Beats function differently. So, how about you? How about you, Aaron? How do you feel about volume, or what do you what do you generally say about that? Well, I'll tell you that I my dilution is probably slightly different than yours and Ari's. So, to say that you know a certain number of CCs, particularly when they settle and you're you're not exactly mixed each time to the to the s- syringe before. Yeah, I think it, I think you can get a sense. How many cc's and it's, it's try to make it equivalent. I mean, we, I think we're probably in the same ballpark, but you know, obviously, large glands you get more beads in. I mean, I think we know that just from our experience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think you're you're absolutely right here. But but I'll tell you, three cc's for a gland this size is pretty good. Yeah, it is, and we dilute. Yeah, I would about, expect it's, less. Actually. It's about 14, 15 to one uh, in terms of what we yeah. we diluted at. I'll take that wire right back. And so it's it's um it's not. You know, super. I mean, I think ten to one is what a lot of people are using. Um, we just tend to like this. I don't know why we've sort of come up with this ratio of fourteen, fifteen to one. Um, but I think, obviously, as you guys know, with these with these larger beads, or if you're using larger bead size, the dilution is really key. Or just like my friend who's an ER doctor, he says the solution's in the dilution once you get a dog bite. So. So we're going to get in this hypogastric here in a second, and then we'll uh, – sometimes it, I always find this to be, frankly, the more uh, challenging of the of the situations is actually selecting out the hypo than it is the uh, prostatic. 
So you're using a, um, uh, a sauce here? Is that what is that what Catherine is? Yeah, it's just a sauce, Aaron. I'm just, <laughs> so I'm I'll just, just tell you, and you know the you know what I'm what I'm going to say here. What are you going to say? I'm waiting for my torque device. My wire. What's going on? What are you going to say? It's a lot easier to do this from above. Oh, I love. I you know, this is it, it is in some degrees. However, don't you find that there are situations where it's it comes off like say I'm not I'm not talking about here, but say it's coming off there, and you just cannot get your 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 yeah. from above. You know, you almost have to use a hooked yeah. catheter. Yeah. So there's a couple tricks. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we showed these uh, during our our live prostate because yeah. we were sort of moving quickly, but. I usually use an angle glide wire uh, with, you know, a vertebral shape or, uh, you know, what you're using there, the long version of the, uh, the glide cap. Yep. So that works. The other thing you can do is just take a Benson wire, which you, you probably have on the table already and yeah. put a, use your fingernail and put a, like a nice curve on it. And just, that flops in probably half the time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this we're in it right now, but I like that the Benson um, woolly type wires are curved. If you could just, I'm just going to uh, set, set up here for my imaging of the hypogastric. But I definitely like that. I definitely like that. I'm going to pop, I'm going to pop back in a little bit. I got to go see a patient, but uh, Sounds good perfect. work so far, Sonny. Thanks, Aaron. We're going to just go on to this right side here. Can you lock it there, Maria? Thank you. Are you still there with me? We might have lost him. All right. So for those of you who are still on there live, and maybe Ari's dialing back up here, fill you in on where we are. Uh, we are on the right side. I hear some noise in the background. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. You're back. You're back. I mean, so on this, I mean, the mountains of North Carolina, I mean, that's what you get. That's what you, get. Yeah, that's what you get, right? It is. So, Ari, right, this is the right side. What are your thoughts so far here? I if you can see this okay. Can you? Yeah, I can see it. Um, so, it looks like you have a Vesco prosthetic trunk, I think. I think uh, so, too. It's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to see there because uh, it almost looks like it's a funnel to the, to the origin of it, right? Yeah, like a exactly like a funnel type trunk, but there's multiple branches coming off that, and it looks like the prosthetic is one of them. Yeah, so we'll use this micro catheter here and uh, try and get into that first. Not there. I think our backup might be the pedendal again, right? In yeah. Of, there's a small yeah. branch from the pedendal. This I think is really the challenge of these, if you will. Again, we go back to these small glands uh, to get into. I'm just loading up. You know, I was going to mention yeah. uh, you guys were talking about tricks from above to get in the hypo. One of yeah, the things yeah. that I like that not a lot of people know, or I guess uh, don't use, maybe it's crazy. I don't know. But I, I use a shapeable uh, glide wire. And a lot of people don't have that on the shelf, but um, they make 035 glide wires that you can hand shape and uh, get a nice hook on it. And that really helps to get in those, uh, those hard hypo origins sometimes. Oh, I like that idea. You know, we use a, it's interesting because we use a shape. I've never even, I didn't even know that existed, first of all. Uh, but yeah, that's a great yeah, so idea. That. All right, so here you are. You're in that best. What do you think of that, mic that, that, that microcatheter holding that position like that? That's yeah. pretty uh, pretty out there. I'm shocked that it can even hold that position because it's like very tenuous. Uh, and yeah. so for it to hold that position like that's pretty, pretty impressive, right? It is impressive. And so this is one of the one here. of the problems with using a like a sauce is that you can't advance it anymore. Um, so you're kind of stuck with that with what you got. I know, but um, I like the sauce because I like to use it for angling in different directions, like left or right. Yeah. Uh, so there I've it had is, certain actually. circumstances where I change out my sauce for a glide class to, to get it down there to get more support. So that's what you're saying. Is the oh, there, there you go. There you you go. know, it's interesting because it's kind of like a... Uh, aneurysmal mouth if you you know what i mean like the way it's yeah it's got that funnel mouth yeah. to it i don't know that i've seen that too frequently there but that's nice uh we'll see how well see this my, wire so you're in the superior vesicle is that where it's been headed umbilical yeah, like that? it's uh, it's like this funnel mouth that gives rise to all those branches yeah and you can see my wire i got the i got the double angle 
GT. So you took the Super Vesicle, yeah. I took it because, you know, I don't want to give it up here. and Don't give it up. Uh, uh, and I'm going to pull back the wire there and see if I could spin it into the other branch. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, and if we can, great. This is the advantage, I think, of a of a wire like this with this short tip. And oh, you see that? You got it, you got it, you got so it. So that's, we always say these are very the painful nice, very origins. Nice, very nice. Oh, there you go. Hey, if I can impress you, then you know I'm doing you, right. Yeah, I just I just want to mention to the listening, the folks listening out there right now, that Sonny could have chosen a very easy case for this live, <laughs> but he chose he chose not to. He chose a hard case of a small gland with with tortuous hypogastrics, which we know Sonny right is the number one factor that leads to harder cases, right? Yeah, I think that um, is. I know, I, there's no doubt. Uh, by the way, this I'm gonna I'm gonna do a run here and see where this goes. This might also be spline the bladder, but we'll check it out here. I think but it is. Right. I mean, it looks like it is. All right. Uh, but there may be branches that I'm missing here, uh, like the one that's going below potentially. Uh, that's a pretty small one, but it's getting there. Oh yeah, there you go. It's getting down there. Is it really getting down? That's rough. Look at this, huh? That's rough. I don't know. I think I. I don't think that's your that's, primary prosthetic right there. I don't think it is either. I think that's actually. It's the beauty of like practicing your catheter skills, right? To get into an artery like this, but then that's not the one you yeah. want. So, but why don't uh, are you still going to do something to it or are you going to leave it? Say again, would you consider embolizing that small branch that looks like it's headed all the way down? Or you just, you know, it it's along? funny you're saying that because I'm looking at it going, you know, but I agree with you. I don't think it's the primary. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to pull back to the origin and do a run, you know, without giving up the access to this artery and make sure I'm not missing a yeah. third branch, right? But if I go back to the right. original run, you would agree that that's that same branch, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, branch on your right and left. So just to confirm. So in this particular case, I think the next best thing is either go into the penendal or go into the obturator and see, because those are going to be the two next likely, right, supplies. Uh, I like the pedendal, yeah. You like the pedendal. And do you say that just because of frequency? Um both frequency and the fact that I see a branch coming off on your own. You see a branch on my own. Well, that helps. So there I'm at the origin. Again, I want to make sure we're just not, we're not missing anything else here and, and that that looks uh, good. There are just those two branches, right? So yep, yep. with that run there, let's just confirm. The last thing you want to do is pull out of this and be like, okay. Yeah, you don't want to, don't want to lose it. No. So... With this micro, I could pull out so small. We could just—I love how it's just advancing right into the. Wouldn't you love that if that's how it happened every time? Yes, that would uh, be great. That'd be great. Pro great. <laughs> so let's get that. I'll get that wire in the penendal. We'll do a run in there, okay? Uh, let me All right, line up. Good. Let me line up my overlay. Line this up here. So the pedando, what would you say from those papers? And obviously those were early on CTA papers from uh, yeah. Tiago's group, but what would you say your instance is around 40% pedando? Still um, more than VP trunk according so to the, the least So experience. I guess the question is, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the, the, the any prosthetic artery or are we talking about the artery that's supplying the central gland? Because I think there was ah. a little bit of confusion about that when they published those papers. Well, that's good. I mean, it's very good. The guard is supplying the central gland because I tend to find that that's more vesicoprostatic than I do pudendal. But Me too. in that paper, Me too. I absolutely agree. They had they had yeah. really that's honed in on the fact that it was it was not that you know. Uh, yeah, I think they were they were taking all comers, all prostatic arteries. So. We we'll have, have to ask Tiago about that next time we see. Him. We'll have to ask him for sure. So let's see here. We're gonna. Both of his iliacs have been uh, a little bit uh, painful. Let's see what we do. So it's funny. Now this I, is something that no matter if you do radial or femoral, it's not going to matter. You know. This is still going to be hard. Yeah, this part's still going to be hard. I, I might have thought about uh, trying to embolize that little branch off the superior vesicle. Um, yeah, because now you're going back and it, thinking, you know, there's not Because really what if you can't find something else at this point? What are you going to do? But I you mean, know. listen, there are cases yeah. like this where, uh, yeah. I think Aaron prefaces, I'll take that, uh, transcend. Our, our, uh, Aaron prefaces in the very beginning that with small glands, this is what you might run into or post-operative cases where you're doing one side. Yeah. I mean, I'm still glad we got very good staining of that central gland on the left. Um, and Danny yep. showed the MRI in the beginning, which I think you also missed, which showed, yeah. um, the, which showed the, um, 
uh, nodules that were in the central part of the gland compressing the uh, prostatic urethra. And I think there's no doubt in my mind, at least from that MRI and comparing it to the angiogram, that's where we were. But um, yes, we would definitely like to see some good supply uh, from this left side. Thank you. I just want to point something out here that this is a, this is difficult. This is hard case. And yeah. Sonny's been doing prostates, what, for like seven, eight years now, probably eight years, something like that. You, you started yeah, your trial back years. in what, 2011, 2012, something like that? 2011, yeah. 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 So there's the internal pedendal right there. Nice. Yeah. And there's that branch right by the tip of your wire. Um, yeah. So we do a nice run from here, right? And then see. Yeah. Yeah. What we got. I so you've been doing I, this for seven, eight years, and yet this, I mean, these are still, these oh, are still yeah, I mean, never, hard I, cases I, I, that don't get easier. Yeah. And I tell us all patients too, is that, you know, you don't, you never know what you're going to see till you get in there. And, yeah. yep. and I don't care if you image it, you do this, CT is this, it still yeah. can be. still going to be hard. You challenging. could have a cone beam here. You could have a CT overlay. This is not going to happen. It doesn't matter. Part. No. And the, I think you're right though. Pedendal seems to be our answer. It looks like that's the branch. The one that's going probably straight of those two, I think. So we'll try and yeah. get it. Would you agree? It seems they both seem to be going under the bladder. The one that's yes. more curvilinear is going, ends up being posterior. Uh, but the one that's straight seems to be going uh, definitely more towards the prostate. So we're going to get into that uh, and see what it looks like. Yeah, but that's now, the thing, Larry, you, so no matter how many sorry. hundreds and hundreds of cases you do, uh, this is the reality of this procedure. You know, these arteries are small. And, it's tough. It's hard. And if you're going to take on all these cases, glands. you know, like, unlike, I think, not to simplify things like hepatic angiography and stuff, but it almost doesn't matter sometimes with things like that if with the tumor is bilobar, unilobar, et cetera. In this particular case, uh, these this, this anatomy is always going to be a little challenging. You know, and it's not just the recognition yep. piece, which we always, I think we stress it's, a lot. There's multiple parts of it. There's recognition, then there's actual getting your catheter where it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, but it is fun. So I will you know, tell you, the, can I make a prediction right now? Yeah. Like almost a hundred percent that when you do your injection of the prostatic artery, you're going to see that branch coming down from the superior vesicle. Yeah. I think you're going to be right about that. Why do you say that? Uh, because that is, it's so classic that we see that you, you, you know, just on the, on the contralateral side, you saw the same thing, right? You, you injected and you saw flow going up to the superior vesicle. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I'm pretty sure that you knew that's good. You're where you need to be. It looks like, but, um, when you do your injection, we'll see that same branch that we just saw from above. Yeah. I don't know if you just saw what I did, but since the catheter, you know, it, the, you can't tell if that arteries come to medial or lateral wall. I just basically pulled the whole catheter back and selected it from further back. Um, I agree. You know, when you're in these really small areas, you tend to get a lot of uh, collateral filling. Uh, but this looks like we're in the prostatic. Let's see if we can get a nice run here for you of what this looks like. Small gland, small staining. There you go. There you go. There's that stain. There it yep. is. There it is. So in this particular case, we can go a little bit further if we need to. A lot of spasm to. there, huh? A little spasm. And you know, it's funny, even on the pre, some there was some disease there. But this, I think, I'm confident we could take a little further in. Uh, so we're going to get some nitro here. Yeah. Uh, after we get this nitro, we'll get a little yep. further in. Um, sometimes you don't want to lose your position, like in the last other side. So there are there is no extra prostatic supply here. So this is a place where I think you'd be safe to just embolize a little bit, right? Um, you could, I would say though, Sonny, on this side with your sauce, where it is, you, you have a pretty secure, I you're agree. not going to lose your base gap like you did on the other side. That's for sure. I agree. So we did like, we did one and a half PAs. I mean, screw yeah. why do, why do one? That's, that's like a standard day for me. Like I'm, I get kicked <laughs> out at least a couple of times. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I know. Or, or my fingers. fellow rips out the catheter by accident because his hands are too stupid. Well, that's 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 a whole other issue, I'm sure. Jeez. <laughs> I'm sure that makes. I'm sure that really makes you cheered up when that happens. Luckily, I oh, don't yeah. have to do that. We just have Tiffany do some of these cases. No, I'm kidding. So. Uh, <laughs> I have one fellow who every time we get where we need to be, tightens the tui down as much as possible, so it's it's absolutely <laughs> stuck, so he can't pull it out. You don't want to say his name here on Jiggle Med because I'm sure he's going to have a hard time. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. But I, but you he's, wouldn't do he, that. But he, but he knows. 
everybody's going, everybody right now is going to the UNC Chapel Hill radiology residency page and they're figuring out who this person is. Who's two? Say again. There we go. There's a nice run coming up. Yep. Yeah, I'm much happier with this. I'm much happier with Beautiful. This I like it. Yeah. I like it. So I'm going to get some more nitro here and then we'll unblock some here. Uh, and then before nice. we sign off, I just want to thank you. If you have any last minute comments, sorry, by the way, there's no collaterals here. If anyone else, your prediction was wrong. I don't want to, uh, I don't wanna, I'm I don't wrong, wanna, wrong. I, don't wanna, I wonder if you embolize a little bit, if we'll start to see it, but we'll see. say again, I wonder if you, if you might see it mid embolization. Yeah, exactly. Well, how hard, how hard did you push on that? You push so pretty hard. Pretty hard. That was a three CC medallion. And what I'm going to do on this side, yeah. unlike the others, I am going to do my embolization here. Start with, um, I, by the way, I just gave 200 of, my, 200 of nitro, 200 nitro. mics of nitro, yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to start with 100 micron particle, get a little bit in here, and then just follow with the yeah. 250s. So nice, nice. Uh, that's what we'll that's what we'll do here, and then we'll wrap it up. And if you notice here, I, I stay in this oblique imaging because it's very easy to see. Uh, you, it's very easy to see, right? When when you <laughs> When you look over here, it's very easy to see uh, what's going anterior, what's going posterior. When you're AP, it's sometimes very difficult to see this. I mean, here it's very easy to see what's behind the bladder, what's under the bladder, uh, what's anterior to the bladder. So uh, that's the reason why, Ari, we tend to stay in this position. Um, it's a little bit higher radiation dose, but uh, even for this case where we had to go up to the left side twice, uh, our total dose with this unit, uh, it's a Phillips unit we're using, is only 450 milligram. So That's great. Uh, Challenge you to get 450 on your unit, Ari, in tomorrow's case. Uh, I don't think you should talk about my unit. <laughs> I don't think that's possible either. Uh, all right, well, good. Listen, before we sign off, I want to uh, thank you for, for, for coming on and, and joining us. And um, if you have any last-minute comments, uh, that'd be appreciated. Otherwise, you can enjoy the rest of your vacation. Yeah, you bet. Um, so I just want to thank Turumo for supporting this. It's always great to get these live cases out there um, so people can see how uh, this works in real life. Um, and thanks, Sunny, for, for putting them, putting them, putting on the line and doing this in front of everyone. Uh, and um, I think this, uh, for a hard case, this turned out to be, you know, done in an hour is pretty impressive. <laughs>